Hello and welcome to our Cybersecurity and Brain Hacks podcast, the first one for 2022. Happy New Year, Eric. I uh, hope happy your New holidays Year. were good and happy holidays to everybody else that's uh, joining and listening to us here. So my name is Brian Powell. I am the network uh, manager here at uh, PCA Technology Group. I'm also an ethical certified, a certified ethical hacker. Um, and joining us today is Eric. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Eric. I'm Dr. Erickson Nealens. Um, I'm an instructor. Pretty much anything brain science, human science related uh, is my area of expertise and excited to talk then about cybersecurity, right, and the human behavior piece of it. And looking now at 2022, new year, and, and what do people love most? They love lists, right, just lists of things. And so what we thought would be great to kick off this year is talking to Brian and kind of these pro tips related to cybersecurity of going into 2022. And Brian curated here a list of the top eight. So we want to go with a unique number, a top eight list of what things can people do in 2022 to keep them uh, and their their accounts safe. So Brian, what did, what did you come up with? So, uh, yeah, so basically this list is just kind of a recap of some of the presentations and and podcasts that we've done last year uh, because it's it's still applicable now. Um, But we figured we'd kick this year off just with with kind of a recap. Uh, And and really, this applies uh, not only to to businesses, uh, but also from from a personal standpoint, too. You should probably be doing this at home in your own personal uh, usage as well. So, uh, you know, the first one come up with is obviously keep your software up to date. Uh, you know, the, the bad guys really, really use uh, and try to exploit uh, software that isn't kept up to date. And I'm talking about not only your operating systems that you're running on your machines on, but like your browsers, your Chrome, your Firefoxes, uh, things like that. And any type of pr- browser plugins, too, that you're using, uh, because all this stuff, if it's not really kept up to date, um, it uh, is really susceptible to potential attacks uh, by, by bad actors by you simply just visiting a website. Uh, and it exploiting, you know, looking for that vulnerability and exploiting it in in a browser or a plugin or something of that nature. Now, Brian, to that to that point, right? So I'm a a layperson, right? I'm not in the cybersecurity world as much. How how do I even know if my stuff is up to date, right? I turn my computer on, I turn my devices on, and what am I what am I supposed to do here? Right. So so in most cases, at least from a, from a company standpoint, your IT provider usually handles handles the updating of, of some of that stuff. Uh, in most times, too, you know, especially in browser cases, when you open up uh, your browser, some of them auto update, some of them inform you that there's an update. Highly suggest you apply those updates if you get that information saying, hey, your browser needs to be updated uh, or uh, you know, maybe a Java. Sometimes you get a, a Java pop up on your machine and says, hey, Java needs to be updated. You know, apply that from a systems uh, OS side. Uh, normally, uh, you know, it's automatic. Uh, it's usually set to automatically go. Um, and, uh, you know, definitely make sure you're applying those updates. And after you apply those updates, also make sure you reboot your machine because, uh, a lot of times those updates don't fully install uh, until you do that. So they're kind of in that limbo stage until you actually fully reboot the machine. But, yeah, most of it is automated. And like I said, from a company side, uh, usually the IT provider manages those those type of updates. And from a home user, it's really kind of just be aware of some of those notification and pop-ups that come up uh, notifying you that there's updates available and that you should be applying those uh, on a frequent basis. Interesting. Okay. So – What you're suggesting is almost getting into a routine. Uh, And how often would you recommend that these are checked? Is it just depends on the number of updates? Is it sporadic, opportunistic? It is, yeah. Unfortunately, it's sporadic, uh, you know, especially in a browser. Uh, You know, anybody that uses Chrome as their default browser can can attest to this, that, uh, you know, Chrome could have seven updates in a week uh, because they, they thought they patched something and they found something else or something else was found. Uh, it could go months without an update, too. Uh, so uh, from an operating system side, uh, you know, like your Windows 10 or your Windows 11, if you've, if you've made that jump to that from Microsoft, uh, they usually do have uh, a normal patch, what we call Patch Tuesdays, uh, where, where they take a Tuesday of, of every month and, and decide to roll out bulk patches. Now, they do 
uh, send out patches uh, that are critical, that need further uh, immediate attention in between those sometimes. But uh, for the most part, it's usually, uh, I think it's the second Tuesday of every every month, actually, I think is what they ended up coming coming down to. It might be the first, too. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not in the field that much anymore uh, when it comes to the OS side of things. Um, but uh, they really, they really c- try to get those out there and automate them on a timely basis, just to make sure people are are t- can get into that normal routine to help them with that. And we know, you know, New Year's New Year's resolutions, habits, and routines are are hard to make. So, are there any tips and recommendations to, you know, get people started with that? Because I'm I could imagine myself, you know, like I'm not checking these often. Um, you know, and, and and things that help people keep with that type of routine. Yeah. So honestly, what I would recommend doing is 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 you can check. Uh, so if you go to your start button on your Windows operating machine and and you bring that up and you just start typing in Windows updates, uh, it will it will actually show you the control panel. You can go in there. You can see if they're set to automatically run. You can see when they last ran. Um, you can check it manually as well too. Um, and you know, I would highly suggest setting it to automatically update. Uh, and, and it'll basically run through most of that stuff on its own. And if it does need to reboot, it'll prompt you in your taskbar saying, hey, you need to reboot. Um, you know, and obviously, like I mentioned, I would definitely follow through with that just to make sure that that is uh, actually the kept kept up to date and, and followed on a timely basis. So, All right. That's great. You know, maybe it's a way to pair it with your maybe weekly check or something else that you get on a routine basis and say, you know what, maybe I need to check the start button too and and make that part of our habit for 2022. Correct. Correct. Great. What else do you got for us? Yeah. So number two on the list is obviously uh, using antivirus uh, on your, on your machines and, and some sort of firewall uh, application firewall. So, so, Luckily for us, uh, if you're running a Windows machine or even a Mac machine, Mac OS machine, uh, they they come default with with firewalls in them um, that can be activated. Um, and you know, obviously, uh, Microsoft does come with with uh, Defender um, that can can be used as as a potential antivirus solution. Uh, and and honestly, uh, it's it's actually not bad from a, from a home use. It's definitely not bad. Um, so it's it's better to run that than nothing. Um, there are some better solutions out there that might take it a step further, but those are usually paid solutions where Defender comes with Microsoft's operating system out of the box. So um, it does anti-malware, it does antivirus, um, and you know it definitely helps protect you more so than keeping the window in your house completely open while you go away for two weeks. So <laughs> got it. That's great. So. You're saying uh, in, in terms of then my kind of antivirus software to, to use Defender. Now, as a, again, general person, can I just assume that that's going to be uploaded on my computer? Or is there something I need to do to verify that that is, in fact, active um, and, and ready and set to go? Microsoft, if you're running Microsoft, Microsoft is pretty good at, at barking at you if you have any of this stuff disabled or it isn't functioning. In the taskbar, it'll come up saying your Windows security system has an alert, and it'll, it'll keep popping Windows up at the bottom of your taskbar frequently. If, if your firewall is turned off or if you don't have AV or if you do have AV and it's not up to date. So Windows does have some built-in checks, at least from the home side. Uh, from a business side, again, most of the time your IT provider is going to be managing these solutions for you, so they were probably going to be monitoring, the, you know, not only your patching, but they'll be monitoring any firewall usage, any AV usage, and whether those are being kept up to date. Yeah, and if there's alerts too, usually they have a control center that will will tell them that hey, you know, we found something on this machine, and maybe they'll reach out to the user asking if they need help or something. Um, so from a business side, it might be more managed. Um, you know, obviously, uh, in, in a home situation on your personal machines, the onus is really on on you, the end user. Uh, but Microsoft is good at 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 least giving you some information in the taskbar that hey, you know, your antivirus isn't updating or it's disabled currently. So, okay, great. So, similar to what we just talked about, if we get in the habit of checking to make sure that these alerts are being addressed, and it, and. Can we tell everyone, you know, where would those alerts be found? Is it going to be something that when I log into my computer, it's going to say it automatically? Is there a certain icon I should be looking for? Yeah, it's down at the if you if you look at your taskbar, uh, a lot of times it'll look like a little blue shield. Um, if you expand your taskbar, that is if you're running the Windows 
security center. Um, that's that's usually where your alerts will be. Um, so it, it and it will pop up when when something changes or occurs. Uh, so that that's from the Windows side. If you're using that solution, uh, you know, if you're using a different third party solution or third party software. Again, most of the time they will pop up in the taskbar somewhere, um, but those solutions are all kind of, their notification systems are kind of all over the board, so it's hard to really say what to look for on, on everything. But in, in normal, the taskbar would be the first place to look for, for those type of notifications, and it'll pop up, you know, saying, hey, there's a problem or we found something, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. So keep alert then in the bottom right-hand corner for anything that, you know, maybe then something that we need to, to address. Correct. Correct. Great. Great, too. I'm excited to see these others. All right. So so number three and kind of number four tie together. Uh, number three, we, we recommending, obviously, using using strong passwords uh, and, and managing to those passwords. So so it goes back to our, you know, make sure you're using passwords that that are fairly lengthy. Uh, you know, we recommend uh, seven to nine characters, at least using mixed characters in that. Uh, and, and making sure that your passwords are unique across where you utilize them. So you're not using the same password across every site you log into in the event that one of those sites potentially could be breached or somehow uh, they, they try to brute force your password. Um, it makes it much more difficult uh, in, in that case. So, And when you're mentioning about brute force, you know, for everyone listening, I remember you sharing that there are these little plugins, right? This Raspberry Pi that could be plugged in, and what is it? In a matter of seconds, a potential could, password yeah. could be hacked, right? Dep depending on the complexity of the password, yeah, it could be a matter of seconds uh, that they could guess your password pretty instantaneously. And uh, you know, there's there's machines that are built out there by by the bad guys or even security people uh, that that are built with specifics. Uh, on, on, you know, brute forcing passwords and figuring out the hashes of these passwords. Um, and it, it, the, the amount of time it takes to, to get lengthy passwords is, is incredible on some of these machines. I mean, it's, it's just, they're so fast. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't necessarily the length, right? You also wanted to have uh, unique characters in there too, right? Wasn't that correct. some of the greatest? So what yep. are some of those recommended either characters, things to do? So, yeah, so that, you know, going back to our previous conversation that we had about this last year, um, you know, we want mixed mixed case uh, for letters. Obviously, we want uppercase. We want lowercase. Uh, we also want a number and a symbol. Um, so all, all those, uh, it has to have at least one uppercase, one one number and one symbol in that in that character in some way, shape or form. And, and symbols are, you know, things like uh, the exclamation mark uh, and, and things like those, a pound sign, perhaps. Uh, or a period or whatever um, that that just adds so much more complexity and entropy into that into the possibilities of of what that password is it makes it very very difficult to guess at that point i bet this is where you're going to be going next isn't there also from last year when we had these making sure that you keep then some of these either password hints or answers safe right and so yeah and so that actually is a number four, but that is that should be maybe. Uh, but yeah, so a lot of people, you know, when we mention about how to keep these strong passwords, they're like, okay, well, what? Do, how do we record these passwords? How do I remember what all these passwords are uh, and things like that? Um, you know, personally, I I say write them down. Um, you know, without getting too deep down in the, the rabbit hole on that. Um, you want to do it in such a way that you're not not recording the entire password as well, too. Um, do it in such a cryptic way, either with, with characters missing and you know what those missing characters are, um, or adding characters to it, um, and, and you know what characters not to enter in when you're putting that password in. Um, but, uh, you know, you can go back and listen to last year's presentation on the password thing to get more, more deep into that. Um, the other thing, too, is a lot of people are using the, the you know, online Password managers, you can do that as well. I'm not a fan of those, but uh, that's another option too. And if you want to know why and why not, go back to last year's presentation on the password uh, podcast, and uh, we, we can get a little deeper into that. <laughs> Great. So, what did you have as number four then? I know I uh, actually as number I four. Flow. Yeah, as number four, uh, I actually have it's an addition to passwords. One way of, of keeping and making sure you, you, that your password doesn't get necessarily compromised or your account doesn't get compromised is adding two factor or multi factor authentication. Um, so, for those of you that may not know what that is, um, the, the concept of two factor is something you know and something you have. 
So the something you know part is your username and your password, which we already discussed. The something you have part is after you put those in, it's going to ask you either for a, a code of some sort. It's either going to uh, you have an application on your phone usually that generates that code. Um, so that's the something you have part. So so if in the event your uh, account does get compromised, or your password does get compromised, um, they're really not going to be able to access your account without having that code. Um, so and that code is generated. Uh, sometimes it's even a push. Uh, in some cases, it may say, hey, are you trying to log in now? And you hit yes or no, and it'll authenticate you back to the site you're trying to log into. That is the most secure way of doing it. Um, but even the code way is it, it works. Uh, it's, you know, nothing is 100 um, percent, but that definitely adds uh, a 99 percent uh, protective layer to any account that you activate with with multi-factor at this point. So and I know some accounts that will have it where it'll ask you, do you want to enable two factor authentication? So I'm assuming your recommendation is to then make that enabled. Um, to I would recommend, yes, if, if you have the ability to do multi factor or two factor authentication, I would activate it across every account that you can. Makes as sense. an additional step. So that's just my personal thing. And what about people who are like, oh, it's that extra step, you know, it, have you, do you have any stories or any things that you've seen quick that make it that that time is worth it to add in that extra layer of protection? Well, if you think about the few seconds it might take you to hit yes or no or enter in that, that, that code that it's looking for versus the amount of time it's going to take from recovery, if your account gets breached, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, you know, I mean, people could take years to try to recover uh, an account, especially if it's a financial account or a stolen identity or something like that. Um, it's just it's, it's so much more worth to take the extra time to, to use this. Um, you know, the problem with security is it always adds a, an additional layer with things, but that additional layer is always worthy uh, because it's an additional layer of protection. So I think that's great. All right. And, and good practices going into 2022. I know right. I jumped ahead, right? I think I got to your was it five on the list. Yeah, number five. Number five is is actually we're at fishing. Uh, so you know you got to learn about the fishing side of things. Um, you know uh, most of the time the hackers are using social engineering, and the social engineering tactic that they tend to rely on heavily is is phishing. Um, and phishing is basically sending out emails uh, and things like that. So you want to definitely be very very cautious of any unsolicited emails, any unsolicited phone calls, uh, anything like that. Uh, the easiest way to explain this, and again, I would say if you want to get real deep into this, you can go back to the present or the, one of the podcasts from last year. Uh, but the bottom line is, is don't open emails from people you don't know. It's that simple. And don't click on links that are in emails that you don't know where they may potentially be going. Uh, open up a browser, go to that link by typing it in yourself. That way you know for a fact you're getting to the real site and not – a site that may be uh, made to look like the real site to steal your credentials. Right. And that, I like that podcast when we did that was a lot of fun because it even talks about how we know as humans, you see a, an, an email or a message, it gets you to have that sense of urgency. I need to click and having the ability to understand that you're in that state, that emotional state and, and wanting to do this, encouraging yourself and empowering yourself to say, eh, is this actually the right time for me to click this? Is this something that I should then think about first? before acting because certainly that one click can have some pretty detrimental impacts to your cybersecurity. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Question everything is my, my take. <laughs> if it looks too good to be true, it usually is. <laughs> <laughs> what else did you have then is there uh, here? Number six. So number six, uh, you want to be careful with your, your personal identifiable information. So anything that's sensitive to you, whether it's your birth date, your social security, your you know phone numbers, anything. Uh, and this really goes back to the whole social media concept. You want to be very, very careful what you're posting on social media. Um, mainly, and I know a lot of people use it like LinkedIn, they use you know, Facebook, they Twitter, Instagram, all the Snapchat, all those. Uh, and I'm not saying one's worse than the other. Just be very, very careful what you're doing there because uh, the bad guys can, can really obtain a whole lot of information uh, by scraping those sites of what you're posting out there. And, and some of those uh, actually reveal some password reset information. Uh, and again, without going too far down in the rabbit hole, um, you can go back to that one, too. It will be under, I think, the social media podcast that we talked about. 
um, that some of the dangers of that and how they could be used to manipulate people. Um, but just be careful what you're doing out there and, and your children, too. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to be posting too many things uh, about your children, uh, personal information for sure. Um, and, and, you know, there's there's a whole lot of bad actors out there, predators out there. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality. Um, and, you know, that information can definitely be used uh, used potentially against you. Yeah, I mean, in social media, certainly, as we talked about in that other podcast, it's become the norm. It's become very heavily used, and there certainly is some opportunity to be able to connect, especially in times that we're in right now. But having that, again, extra layer of thinking about the long-term effects, the impact that some of this information can have, and how it really affects your cybersecurity is, I think, something really then to be cognizant of in the new year. Yes, correct. What do you have for number seven? So number seven is uh, making sure your your data is backed up. Uh, you know, obviously, in the event that that you do have some type of an incident or something of that nature, uh, that uh, you know, you're really your whole saving grace is is your backups. Um, and again, from a company side, your IT provider or, or internal IT team should be managing those backups for you and and testing them as well um, to make sure that they're good backups. Uh, the last thing you want is to think you're doing backups and find out that when the time comes when you need it, that, oh, wait, this backup wasn't even working. So uh, you should test it on a regular basis. Um, you know, usually that could be every two weeks. It could be weekly. Um, it could be monthly, depending on what what your your uh, what your ability is to, to handle, you know, data loss potentially. Um, and then, uh, you know, just make sure you're doing it. You know, from a home side, it's not as easy. Um, but usually, you know, you can if you're a Google user, you can use Google Drive, perhaps. Uh, if you're an Apple user, you can use the, the Apple Cloud. Um, if you're a Microsoft user um, with with their email, you can use OneDrive. Uh, some people, you know, there's a whole bunch of different solutions out there you could potentially use as, as backups. Um, and you can even do it, you know, locally, too, with a USB drive. You know, make sure you're, you're running a backup to a USB drive. Uh, Western Digital and some of those other manufacturers actually have utilities that that will let you do that with an external drive uh, that you purchase at like a Best Buy or or one of your consumer stores or something. So uh, just make sure you're doing backups because again, you know, in the event something happens or some bad actor gets in there and and happens to erase all your data, um, then uh, at least you have a way of getting that back potentially. And is there a recommended time schedule that you would have for people to back up their data? I'm thinking, is it something that would be the same time course of looking with regards to their um, antivirus or any other updates similar to what we talked about earlier today? Yeah, it would be a good idea to get into that cadence only because then it's habitual. You know, hey, I'm going to check my updates. I'm going to check my backups or I'm going to perform a backup and things like that. It is good to do that. You know, uh, again, it's it's flexible, but depending on what what your uh, capability is of, of and it's not necessarily the capability, what, what your tolerance is of, of potentially losing data. So, you know, you, what you got to remember, if you're only doing it once every two months, Okay, well, you you could potentially lose two months worth of data because if it happens in between that two month period, you're losing the data back to the the previous backup. So if your tolerance is is you know I can't lose anything more than a day, then I guess you're doing it daily. Um, but you know from a personal side, it might be more flexible. Businesses tend to you know we're, we're doing backups on some of our clients every every hour. Uh, sometimes it's every 15 minutes because the tolerance level isn't there to handle any more data loss than that. Others are, you know, daily, some, some, you know, from a personal side, I would say weekly is probably good um, uh-huh. unless you're, you know, a, a home business running taxes and it's tax season. Maybe then you didn't want to. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say weekly or monthly is probably uh, more in line with a with a home user versus a business uh, for a backup schedule. That's interesting. And I think, of, you know, when I look at the new year, creating a new year's resolution, this is certainly then a good uh, area to look into and in making this into more of a habit. Correct. And so what Correct. do you have as that last but not least, you know, part of so our. The last but not least. And, and this is this is uh, this is something that's that's definitely debatable. But uh, don't use public Wi-Fi. Um, we talked heavily about this in in, in last year's uh, podcast. Uh, and, and funny enough. Um, I, I just saw a post uh, from it was it was a Yahoo article that said that people shouldn't be afraid of using public hotspots anymore, and I, I just cringed 
And I'm thinking the guy that wrote that or the person that wrote that uh, obviously is completely oblivious to the potential of what kind of damage can be done on a public Wi-Fi. Uh, and I would love to find out who it was uh, to, to correct them or, or at least maybe physically show them how dangerous it actually is because they're spreading information out there that that isn't accurate under a false sense of security. Um, my take is, again, uh, you can go back to last year's uh, podcast on this, but uh, do not do anything on public Wi-Fi that you wouldn't walk up to a complete stranger and show them or tell them about. That's simple. Yeah, and I remember when we, we talked about that, it really is incredible. It's like giving that device over to someone that you you don't even know, a complete stranger. And I think thinking about it that way is really what's happening in that situation when you use that public Wi-Fi. And you know, do we as individuals want that information out there, right? And do we trust what it is that we'd be giving to a complete stranger? And so I know it certainly changes our mindset with regards to Wi-Fi and how it may be just, oh, yeah, you need to connect to the Internet, but not realizing there's a lot of information that we may be inadvertently giving. Correct. Yep, correct. And, and like I said, it's unfortunate that that article came out because the, the information that's in there they're, they're, they're definitely spreading a, a false sense of security that I don't agree with, um, and I can I can actually prove that what they're saying is incorrect and, and show you that it's still possible even though they say it isn't. Um, but uh, it's just one of those things where definitely definitely don't be using public Wi-Fi for anything financial, anything work-related, um, maybe a simple web search perhaps, but I wouldn't be checking your emails. I wouldn't be checking your Facebooks. That's, that's just me personally because I know – that the potential is there. It doesn't mean it's going to be at every place you go, but the potential is there. Um, and just that potential enough is enough for me to deter from not using it. Use your Wi-Fi plan or your, your built-in uh, data plan, uh, the cell data plan. It's much more secure than a public Wi-Fi. Great. These are great. These are great tips, I think, going into 2022. Um, I know personally I learned so much from talking with you, Brian. I really appreciate you uh, sharing these tips with me. Uh, it's a great way for me to go forward uh, with a new year. And I look forward to continuing these conversations and looking at cybersecurity for 2022. Yeah, we have a lot more of these planned for this coming year. Uh, obviously, the topics are going to be a little different, uh, and uh, we'll have to you have to stay tuned to see what those topics are. So I thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Eric, again for joining us uh, from from the psychological side and the brain side of things. Um, and I look forward to our next discussion. Me too. Take care.